Corpus Christi and Oxford. And I'm Gordon Campbell, I'm Fellow in Renaissance Studies at the University of Leicester. And we both share an enthusiasm for the King James Bible. Um, I was one of the curators for the Bodleian Library's King James Bible Exhibition in 2011, which celebrated 400 years since the publication of the King James Bible. And I once wrote a book on the King James Bible a few years ago, and for the last seven years I've worked for a Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C. And it's a delight to come here to Wadham to see your newly restored um, King James yes. <laughs> Bible in, uh, in, all, in all its glory. Um, it's open here at the title page, which is an engraving by Cornelius Bohl from Antwerp. Um, the title page is immediately striking in its architectural structure and its alliance of key iconography from the Old and the New Testaments. So at uh, flanking the central panel, you have Moses on one side and Aaron on the other. And in the corners, you have the four writers of the gospel. Um, above the panel with the title, you have uh, the lamb, one of the figurations of Christ in typology, and then underneath the pelican feeding its young, which is always very appealing to me because that is also the symbol of Corpus Christi College. We have a pelican in our front quad. But rather more bloodily, it's feeding its young from its own blood. Uh, the, the image of the crucifixion. It doesn't sound like a very appetizing meal to me. Now, can you identify the people? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, um, as my children have discovered, as we've been tramping around um, various um, sites during the course of the summer in Italy, the quickest way to identify the gospel writers is through the animals that they're associated with. So in the top right hand corner we have St Mark with his rather benign looking lion, which anyone who's been to Venice and seen St Mark's Cathedral will recognise with the lions that are in the square in Venice. Um, down on the right it's St John with the eagle, which you should be because eagles can stare into the sun. Um, Luke with his ox and then Matthew up here in the top left hand corner. This is a very interesting page for many reasons. At the top uh, there are a few letters in Hebrew. Uh, they spell uh, the word that is was written at the time as Jehovah, and we now tend to say Yahweh. Um, you can tell that this is not a forgery because over the H, the second letter from the right, there's supposed to be a dot. And uh, in forged copies, uh, there's always a dot, and in real copies, there's not a dot. So that's the father, uh, Yahweh. And then the, the dove represents the Holy Spirit, and then the, um, the, the lamb uh, represents the sun. It's the first time a trinity has, has appeared on the, on, on the title page. Um, in terms of Moses and Aaron, uh, they had only appeared on uh, two very obscure Bibles in, in Louvain, uh, a deeply Catholic place, and it's interesting to ask why, um, not Moses, but why Aaron he, uh, appears here. And the answer is that he's a priest. Um, and the King James folk and King James himself um, thought that the Bible should not be read by just anybody, that it should be understood through the mediation of the priest. And that's why Aaron is here. It had never happened before in England. Uh, they'd never been paired in England. But subsequently, in uh, Anglican churches in the 17th century, uh, there were many church paintings, paint, paintings in the churches, that, uh, that, that showed the same pairing of, of, of Moses and Aaron. There are a couple of other things. Um, St. Uh, Peter is here, and he's uh, holding the keys. Um, the chap who did this uh, was a Catholic, of course. Um, in earlier Bibles, Coverdale, for example, uh, each of the apostles gets a set of keys. There are many keys all over the place. Uh, but this Bible reverts, oddly enough, to the Catholic notion of uh, St. Peter as the keeper of the keys. We think of it as the Catholic notion, but in fact, in the Bible, uh, the keys are given to, Pe to Peter. So it's simply being, uh, being true to, to that. Another interesting difference between this title page and uh, earlier title pages in English is that there is uh, no monarch 
featured here. Yes. Um, uh, famously, the Great Bible um, featured a title page with Henry VIII dispensing um, the largesse of the translation to the people, um, which is famously interpreted as, a, as an expression of hierarchy and order um, mm -hmm. in the kingdom. And there's a prison down in the bottom right-hand corner where all those who fail to um, observe obedience and decorum are going to be put. Um, and they're all shouting vivat rex in, in these wonderful banners. But there's no monarch here. Um, another interesting point is that this is not signalled on the title page as a Bible that is authorised. It says it is appointed to be read in churches. So although this is called the authorised version, um, it doesn't declare itself to be so. So many people prefer to call it the King James Bible mm -hmm. rather than the authorised version. And fascinatingly, when it was first um, printed, it was often referred to as the new translation. The idea of its being King James's Bible was a Scottish invention, wasn't yes, it? Yes. Where it was actually thought of as King James's Bible, because King James, of course, was King James VI of Scotland. And so it is to the Scots that we have the idea that this is, this is the Bible of King James, rather than just as it was typically referred to um, at the time, initially, as the, the new translation. Mm. You can tell from my name that uh, I'm of Scottish ancestry. Um, so I take the view that all good things are invented in Scotland, stolen by the English, and then sold to the Americans. And that, in a sense, is the story of the King James Bible. It, 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 the, uh, the initial idea of a new translation uh, arose in Scotland in 1601 when the, uh, the Church of, of Scotland met, met and James was there, and they decided to have a new translation of the Bible. Uh, what happened was it was referred to a subcommittee, and we're still waiting for that subcommittee to <laughs> report, uh, but when James, two years later, became King of England, uh, the idea was still in his head, and uh, as a result, when it was proposed, this was the Bible that, that emerged from, from the proposal. And the, one of the interesting things is that when it was proposed at the Hampton Court Conference in 1604, it was to a certain extent an afterthought. The, yes. um, uh, the delegation of what's called the Puritan Party, prob party probably better called the, the, the godly section of the Church of England, who were pressing for reform in the matters of vestments and ceremony, um, hadn't necessarily come demanding a new translation of the mm. Bible, but it was the one of the proposals um, that they put forward. It's that proposal is attributed to John Reynolds, who was uh, then president of um, Corpus Christi, and not a particularly adept politician, it's fair to say. He was a scholar of Greek and Hebrew, um, not a man who'd probably had a shopping list of things he wanted from the king. Mm -hmm. um, and um, the king seized on this idea that there, there being a new translation, and it could be said to be one of his most astute political decisions. Absolutely. Because rather than having two warring parties in the church, he managed to combine the two parties mm -hmm. together. And one of the remarkable things about the translation is how for a few decades at least it lost the boil of ecclesiastical contention um, in England. Of course that contention spilled out necessarily in the 1630s and led to the Civil War. But for a couple of decades, and certainly for a very difficult five years after his accession, um, the people who could have created a lot of trouble for him by arguing with one another and forcing or holding back the Church of England from further reform were, were very gainfully employed um, in making a new translation of the Bible. So one of the important things about this Bible is not a sectarian Bible. Yes. Um, and there had previously been a certain rhetorical sectarianism hovering over the translations of the Bible, if you like. The idea that the Geneva Bible was favoured by um, private readers and possibly the more uh, reformed elements of the church and the bishops' Bibles read in churches, so the more, if you like, the authorised versions as they declared themselves to be. Um, and so that, if you like, it could, I wouldn't say necessarily that it was a plan, but it was a very canny piece of mm -hmm. Scottish politicking, if you like, that and, James And the there. fact that it's in English is significant. Yeah. I mean, yeah. people whispered behind James's back that he could speak Scots and Latin and French, but he couldn't speak English. Yeah. And here he was becoming head of the Church of England, uh, and what better way to 
illustrate his English credentials than a translation of the Bible into English. When he was involved with the Bible in Scotland, uh, the, the first printing of the, uh, the, the Geneva Bible in Scotland, the preface was not in English, it was in Scots, because he was playing to his, his Scottishness at that stage. There's not a word of Scots in this. It's resolutely English because he was the head of the Church of England. And his primary intention around 1603-1604 was to further the idea of union, wasn't yes, it? Yes, yes, absolutely two, right. Two kingdoms. There were two editions of this Bible in 1611. Uh, we don't know when they were published, but we know that one known as the He Bible, the Great He Bible, was published first. And uh, a second edition, published in the same year and, and reprinted for two more years, was called the Great She Bible. Um, this does not reflect a, a single difference between them. There, there are hundreds and hundreds of differences, but it's the one we can all, we can all remember. And it refers to a passage in, in Ruth, Ruth 3.15, and it says in this version, and he went into the city. Now this is about Ruth and Boaz, and the difficulty is the context makes quite clear that she went into the city. So we've got the Hebrew saying one thing, or the Hebrew majority text saying one thing, and the Bible saying the other. So it, it's a point of contention among the translators. It's clear that after the first edition uh, was published, that the minority opinion uh, prevailed, and the second edition of this Bible says, and, and she went into the city. Um, as it happens, the, the Bibliotheca Hebraica Stuttgart Ensis records that minority reading in the Hebrew. So I, I, it, it's, it, it's not, it's not illegitimate. Uh, but it is a, 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 a minority reading. While we're here um, looking at the text of the Bible, it's very interesting to see that the King James Bible was printed in black letter, yes. which allies it visually very much and in double columns with the authorised, the big authorised church Bibles of the 16th century, which had also used black letter, which was typically the typeface used for legal documents yes. and so forth. The Geneva Bible, on the other hand, had been printed in Roman type, which is much more readable um, to us now, and certainly probably even at the time, and it had used long lines um, and um, also had been the um, first English translation to use um, verses to help mm -hmm. navigate. Um, this copy is in a, an original uh, 17th century binding, which has been restored. Um, that's very interesting. When it was sold in 1611, um, it was sold at a price of 30 shillings, but it was sold in unbound sheets. So whoever purchased it in the first instance then had to uh, take it to the binder uh, to have it bound. And that initial binding is what survives to this very day. That's not very common in, in these Bibles and it's pleasing to see it. Indeed, and just this little hole here um, is where the book would have been chained Indeed. Um, yes. in order to stop people walking off with it. Though with a book of this weight, it would be quite a challenge, but uh, <laughs> that would be, that's typical of a book that's been at some point in a chained library yes. where a chain would go from the shelf to the book and to stop it being um, moved around. Um, another interesting thing about the uh, binding question is that you will find copies of the 1611 bi yes. uh, Bible that mix sheets mm. from the he and the she Bibles. Yes. So as with all early printed books, every copy is unique. We can divide things into editions, but when you're looking at them as well, you've always got to be aware that the sheets may have been um, uh, different mm. in, uh, in different copies uh, um, from uh, the same edition. Yeah. That's also of relevance to the King James Bible process because one of our best witnesses to how the Bible was translated is a copy of the Bishop's Bible that was printed in 1602, that's now in the Bodleian mm -hmm. Library, um, which ha um, records um, in the margins the um, discussions of the six companies or committees um, that translated the Bible. Mm -hmm. And um, analysis has only been partial so far on the 1602 Bodleian copy of that 
Bishop's Bible, um, but it, it looks as though the sheets have been put together in one copy from different committees. Mm -hmm. So the annotations don't reflect the thought of any one of the six companies who translated the Bible, but are uh, a mixture. Mm -hmm. there's, a good, several good, of them. there's a good de Phil thesis to be written on, on that Indeed. Uh, on, yes. on that piece. This is an interesting page from the, the, the Song of Solomon. The um, translators were forbidden to have notes. Um, King James didn't like notes. Uh, and they, being academics and therefore naturally devious, um, found ways around this prohibition. So if you, you look at, uh, at this uh, chapter, uh, chapter 5 uh, and the little headnote at the beginning that summarizes what's in the chapter um, says, Christ awaketh the church with his calling, the church having a taste of Christ's love is sick of love. In other words, uh, a, a Christian theological commentary has been smuggled in via the notes, uh, so controlling the reader's understanding of it. And well, the word love is a very important word mm -hmm. in the um, formation and also the afterlife of the King James Bible, yep. because it famously uses the word charity yes. in 1 Corinthians 13, in, a, in verses that in the English tradition stemming from Tyndall had used the much more English word, love. Indeed. Um, the translators, of course, were uh, speaking in Latin. Yeah. Uh, that was the language of the universities then. And um, when you're speaking in Latin, um, caritas is the Latin word, charity seems sort of natural, and love sounds like a teenager's word. Yes. Uh, so, so giving it dignity, they reverted to the whole, the Catholic tradition, if you like, of calling it charity. And I think it's the Dewey Rings mm. version has charity, doesn't it? So it is often thought that the King James Bible introduced charity yes. into 1 yes. Corinthians 13. It is quite often cited as being the archetypal resonance and language yes. of the King James Bible. And in fact, it is um, Latinate and derived from the, um, um, if you like, the Catholic tradition. Yes, yes, yeah. absolutely yeah. right. Yeah. Though the Dewey Rings New Testament was translated too late, I think, wasn't it, yep. to be used by the translators, but it is, well, it partakes of the same. The New Testament was the used, New Testament. The, the New Testament was used um, as emerges in the translator's notes. The Old Testament was published too late, yeah. uh, although the translator's preface quotes, well, is, is clearly aware of the Douay Bible, the, the translators weren't. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah. There's a very curious thing when one examines the page in that the, uh, the black letter type is interspersed with um, small uh, bits in, in Roman. So the, the singing, it says in large letters, and of birds in small ones, and in a little further down, uh, and a... I've lost the place. A little further down in the secret places and places is, is very small. Um, these are words that aren't in the Hebrew um, but have been supplied uh, to make sense of the sentences. In other words, they're, they're reasonable inferences from the rest of the sentences. And you can tell from this that they're relatively unimportant. What happens when King James Bibles are reprinted now in the 21st century is that these supplied words are printed in italics. And as a result, they look like the most important words in the Bible. When exactly the opposite is true, they are the inferences that are there so that you can make sense of the sentences. The, the um, ubiquitous presence of what are called decorated capitals, which is a very common feature of early modern printed books. For the first letter of a new chapter would use a decorated capital like that. Sometimes, um, the, the capitals are decorated with little um, illustrations and the printing of the King James Bible didn't discriminate very um, uh, attentively mm -hmm. um, between um, pagan and Christian or Judeo-Christian matter in terms of how the decorated capitals were chosen. If we go to the beginning of the Gospel of Matthew, for example, 
um, we see a very splendid woodcut decoration that depicts Neptune, even with his trident, um, which has no conceivable relationship no. to what's <laughs> actually happening in the text. And um, possibly even more scandalously, the beginning of Romans has a woodcut featuring Daphne turning into a laurel um, as a consequence of her pursuit by Apollo, one of the most um, famous of classical stories um, from the Ovid's Metamorphoses, that would have been very well known to um, every single schoolboy who'd gone through grammar school. Um, and um, nobody quite knows how these pagan uh, illustrations found their way into the Bible. Um, David Norton um, makes the very plausible guess that um, because Robert Barker, the King's printer, who had the license to print Bibles, so obviously got this commission, um, was printing very, very many Bibles all at the same time and very rapidly. Um, the, the, if you like, um, simply what was available in the printing shop was used to fill out the page and make it look beautiful. And it's indisputable that they it give a, it, it, these um, uh, woodcuts give a very pleasant look to the page, but there is clearly a certain disjunction. Yes. Um, on the other hand, I'm rather pleased by it because um, the translators, who as Gordon said were all speaking in Latin with one another, were very learned classicists. They were. <laughs> um, they did not perceive a distinction between, if you like, the areas of knowledge that we might see to be competing nowadays. For example, between what we call the humanities or the sciences, or between um, classical and yes. Christian yes. learning. Yes. Um, so um, one of the translators, John Spencer, for example, has uh, copies of his Greek books of drama that he's annotated. And when the general meeting met in 1610 to finalise the text of the Bible, they freely made reference to the use of um, Greek in classical contexts, um, as well as biblical ones, in order to help them decide how to make a translation. So from this, um, one can read both a narrative of the slightly chaotic printing of the King James um, 1611, as we saw from the He and She Bibles, also from the fact that possibly that engraved um, title page was lost or damaged in the print shop because it doesn't appear after the first few editions. Mm -hmm. Um, so we have a narrative of chaotic printing, but we also have a narrative that really captures the sense of, of the um, blended and holistic and deeply curious learning of the Bible translators who brought all of their resources in geometry, mathematics, botany, early entomology um, and Latin and Greek literature to bear on their translations. So I think it's actually very apt that we should find Neptune and Daphne buried here amongst the text of the Bible. The 1611 King James Bible also includes a fascinating set of genealogies uh, that go from Adam to the Virgin Mary that were produced by John Speed who had a license to um, add in his genealogies and maps of the Holy Land which is why um, they appear. Um, he, his descendants later had to be bought out of that right actually at some considerable expense. <laughs> So these are, if you like, uh, a, a, an accretion to the Bible that connect it with um, the outside world because John Speed um, was a, a historian and a cartographer and he was very connected, he was a member of the Merchant Tailors Company and was very connected with the Merchant Tailors' interest in trade and travel um, and of course the Middle East, the Eastern Mediterranean, um, is the locus not only of the biblical events, but also a lot of commercial interest at the time. So it is no accident, this is a very long genealogy as you can see, that John Speed's map of the Holy Land um, found... It's, it's in there. It's in there, isn't it? Yes, it's hidden. Here it is, here it is. <laughs> John Speed's map of the Holy Land, here. There's a very, very strong visual resemblance to the mapping that he was also doing of English cities, yes. um, of England, um, and of um, the, if you like, the kind of the, the wider um, cultural and geographical and topographical context that was of extreme interest to scholars because of the light it mm -hmm. shed mm -hmm. on um, biblical history, but also, of course, um, to merchants as well.
and Speed was greatly praised by the Merchant Tailors Company for his work as a historian and as a cartographer. And rightly so. Rightly so. Yeah. The genealogy ends with, uh, with Jesus, doesn't it? Yes. Here. And Joseph. It, it, it has to Jesus. deal with the virgin birth, uh, which it does, um, tracing his consent um, by law and by nature, and, and by law and by nature is a way of uh, avoiding the awkwardness of Joseph not being his father, except in law. This is the second title page in the 1611 King James Bible, which is for the New Testament. Um, very different in style, as you can see, um, and it depicts the 12 tribes of Israel mm -hmm. on the left, balanced off um, in very neat fashion by the um, disciples on the right hand side. Um, the, this is the title page that gets shifted to the beginning of later editions and reused as the title page for the whole um, once the um, uh, Antwerp engraving, um, either because it was lost or damaged, yes. um, uh, stops being used anymore. Okay, we're now going to have a look at the Bishop's Bible. Um, the King James Version was not a fresh translation. It was a revision of the um, previous Bible, the, the uh, Bishop's Bible, so-called because uh, many of the translators either were bishops or were later to become bishops. It editorially was quite weak in that there was no system of panels checking each other's work. Basically a busy bishop uh, went home of an evening and instead of having a gin and tonic um, undertook a bit of translation and it was sent to the printer. And as a result of that sometimes it's, it's rather literal. Um, there is a, an idiom uh, in, in Hebrew uh, that refers to the, the surface of the water. It, it survives in Greek and indeed in English. You can talk about the surface of the water as its, as its face. Um, and the verse that we know from uh, King James as, as uh, cast your bread upon the waters was translated here in the uh, book of Ecclesiastes by a very weary bishop as lay thy bread upon wet faces and it, it's literally quite correct but it's also completely incomprehensible and that kind of error occurred rather too often in this bible and it's one of the many reasons why the king james bible is a, a, a superior bit it's editorially much more scrupulous people checked each other's work and all those, those literalisms uh, disappeared. Let's take a look now at the Geneva Bible. Now the Geneva Bible is the Bible that would have been known to Shakespeare, for example, um, as he was growing up. Um, and it has a very strong influence on the King James Bible. Indeed, Miles Smith, in the um, translator's preface, quotes from the Geneva Bible, yes. <laughs> rather than quoting from the translation that he has just, that he's actually introducing. And so the longevity of Geneva carries on long into the um, 17th century. Now, Geneva Bible is um, fascinating, taught so-called because it was translated by Marian exiles in Geneva, many of them people from Oxford, uh, Protestants who had fled during mm. Mary's reign um, and indeed um, it was um, um, funded by the Bodley family who Thomas Bodley later founded the Bodleian Library so there are many deep connections if you like again between Bible translation and the mercantile community as we saw with the King James Bible, but also um, with, if you like, um, political, religious upheaval, and also with the, the fragility of academic posts in mm -hmm. that time, if you like. You could be moved in and out of your fellowship or your presidency of the college at the whim of the monarch as the religious preferences of the times um, changed backwards and forwards. So the Geneva Bible was translated by exiles in Geneva in the middle of the 16th century, and it was quickly very popular. It had 
um, uh, verses, for example. One of the reasons why it adopted the system of using biblical verses was because the annotation, the studying, what the godly called searching in the scriptures was very, very important to the godly mm. mindset. And if you have verses, you can navigate and you can write concordances, you can write scriptural study notes, and all of a sudden you've got a way of using your Bible in groups, in private, mm -hmm. and for the purposes of vernacular study. So this was a Bible that very much took itself out of institutional and ecclesiastical contexts, into people's hands, into people's homes. It was very often um, printed in much smaller formats than this, mm -hmm. and very often bound up with matters such as concordances or maps of the Holy Land. It became, if you like, a kind of sort of, um, a sort of package of sort of teaching resources or mm. self-educating resources um, in Christianity. And on the title page of this um, Geneva Bible, we also have um, declared that it has most profitable annotations. Now, the profitable was again one of those aspects of Puritanism that was very, very dear to their hearts. The idea that you could gain um, spiritual profit, benefit, mm -hmm. richness, nurturing, food, nourishment from searching and studying the scriptures is an integral part of reformed thinking, living and um, behaving. They were also fascinated by, if you like, the culture of the Old Testament, weren't mm. they? Um, uh, uh, some people who attended Sunday school may remember, as I do, building models of the Temple of Solomon. Do you, do you, uh, and, and Noah's um, Ark. And Noah's Ark. <laughs> and it's fascinating. When I, I remember that from my childhood. When I first saw a Geneva Bible, I realised why I'd been doing that. Because mm. there are illustrations here, for example, of the location of the Garden of Eden. There are illustrations of what the Temple of Solomon mm. was meant to look like. Illustrations of... Here we are, some of the um, artefacts of um, uh, Hebrew religion. And this, if you like, cultural amplification and annotation of um, the Bible was integral to the godly way of reading. Mm -hmm. um, and so here we have just a, a, I've just opened this page at random to, and have found all of these annotations that, that appear um, along the side of the Geneva and even one of these little pointing devices that you see very, very often mm. in um, early modern books of all kinds, where the reader uh, is almost kind of sort of putting a little sort of early modern post-it note there, yes. saying, kind of, you know, take note of this. Um, so just, there are many examples in this copy, actually, of that. So this is a copy that was clearly read um, attentively um, by an individual. This is a very early copy printed in Geneva, is it 15... 62, 62. Think, but of course it later became an English Bible and yeah. it was printed by the King's printer, uh, the Queen's printer uh, under Elizabeth alongside the, the Bishop's Bible and uh, after the accession of James was, was printed by the, the King's printer. The, the annotation uh, is reflective of Geneva thinking and there was a side of Geneva that, that wasn't altogether friendly to monarchs. And one of the things that James disliked about this Bible was the annotation, which he thought was insufficiently respectful of monarchy. Uh, there's a good example here in, in, uh, at the end of the first chapter of, of Exodus. It's the story of the midwives. You, you may recall that uh, Pharaoh uh, orders the midwives to kill all the male Jewish babies as they're born. And uh, after a, a lapse of time, he, he has the midwives in to ask how they're getting on with their genocide. And they say uh, that they uh, have been unable to oblige because Jewish women are built differently from Egyptian women in that their loins are much slipperier. And uh, by the time they arrived to attend birth, the baby was gone the whole time. Uh, was gone al already, as a result of which they, uh, they weren't able to kill the babies. Uh, now, as, as an excuse, that's in the, the dog ate my homework category. Um, but the interesting part is the annotation in the Geneva Bible, which says, uh, talking about the midwives, their disobedience herein was lawful, but their dissembling was, was evil. 
So you're not allowed to tell a lie, dissembling is wrong, but disobeying the Pharaoh, a king, was all right. And James took deep exception to this. Um, the thought of disobeying a monarch in any circumstance was to him utterly unacceptable. Yeah. And he wanted a Bible without these, 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 uh, the, these notes that subverted the monarchy in his view. And, and, and our um, annotator um, took the opposite view, was clearly an annotate, annotator who enjoyed these moment. There's a little one of these little hand signals to verse 17 which says the midwives did not as the king of Egypt commanded them but preferred alive the men children. And you can also see the politics of Geneva operative here yes, yes. with the um, running header here. This is Israel oppressed and um, people of a reformed sensibility were very very uh, attentive to uh, in intimations of tyranny. Um, Protestants in the continent had been um, persecuted, particularly in the Low Countries during the um, mid uh, 16th century, um, and so were very alive to any of the exactions, as they mm -hmm. called them, mm -hmm. um, of tyranny um, and oppression. So the annotations um, and that what you call the paratextual material, the material that surrounds the rubrics at the beginning of the chapter, the annotations, the running heads, are all um, expressing a form of political and theological resistance to rulers because the, the, the mindset was that rulers are inherently disposed to oppression, yes. um, to tyranny, um, and that they need to, that, that midwives and Protestants need to stand up to tyranny. <laughs> Indeed. There are some signs of haste in this. There's a capital N there that, Backward, that's yeah. backwards. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there are many examples of that kind of thing in, in the King James Bible. Um, the word and, A-N-D, is uh, on 28 occasions in King James, comes out as A-U-D, uh, because an N is, is just a U upside down. And uh, mm -hmm. it, 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 it all went haywire. It's the most common misprint. Yeah. Of course, Bible translation has always been controversial. Um, and here we have a 1541 copy of the Great Bible, the one that has uh, that famous um, title page of Henry VIII dispensing his uh, largesse to the people and commanding their obedience. Um, famously, in um, two chronicles, um, there was a, a little crime of a king inserted for, again, um, political, religious, polemical ends, in that one of the crimes of um, Joachim, um, his abominations, as the translations has it, was um, added to the, he to the Hebrew text that he um, uh, it, uh, it commanded carved images um, to be um, held up. Um, and that is a fairly blatant piece of polit politicking mm -hmm. with the biblical text. And of course, um, uh, Protestants and Catholics argued about many things throughout the whole of the 16th century. One of the things they argued about most vociferously, and probably with some small de no small degree of enjoyment for the, those of them who were academics, was the translation of the Bible. And of course, when it became evident that um, uh, that that had been flagrantly inserted as a tyrannical crime in the new to old in the Old Testament. Um, the uh, Catholic polemicists leapt on that as an example of, of a heinous kind of pol politicising of the Bible. <laughs> Now, the, the Bible as a, as a book is a, a Christian invention of late antiquity. Um, Jews had traditionally um, kept their Bible on scrolls, and scrolls don't have an obvious order. They're simply uh, you know, slotted into separate cases. But the Christians used the codex for whatever reason, which enabled books to be bound together. Early um, Christian Bibles um, were, were large things. Uh, they were meant for institutional, for ecclesiastical use. And for a long time, there were no Bibles that were meant for individuals. Uh, the process whereby that happened began with um, collections of the Gospels, or sometimes the Gospels and, and Psalms. 
And this is a, a, a splendid 11th century example uh, of the Gospels being brought together, um, magnificently illustrated for the benefit of a private owner. And that, it, it's a very early example of that happening. In terms of a complete Bible, um, there is a, a form of Bible called, called the Paris Bibles that were published in uh, the 12th and 13th century um, that were for private owners. This is a 13th century example, magnificently gilded. I mean, the, the illustrations are absolutely fabulous. The, the print is, well, I say print, it's written by hand, but it, it has the regularity of type. It's an astonishing thing. Obviously uh, owned by wealthy uh, owners who could afford to commission such a book. But this was the beginning of private ownership of the Bible, which didn't come into its own until the printing press made mass production of Bibles available in the early 16th century.